we think about the life of the Buddha. He was born under a tree. He gained awakening under a tree. Recording in progress. He gained awakening under a tree. And then he passed away under two trees. So here we are out sitting among the trees. And it's good to remember that the Buddha found the Dharma in the wilderness. But he was able to bring it into civilization. In other words, he found it in seclusion. Because even when you're in the wilderness, you're not totally alone. All the other animals are out there, the spirits of the trees, the spirits of the place. But they generally leave you alone enough so you can look into your mind. When you're with other people, you're getting their thoughts, their ideas, their opinions placed in your mind. And it's hard to sort out what do you really believe and what do you simply pick up from others. But when you're out alone, that's when you have time to sort things out. And the Buddha was able to reflect what was the big problem in his life. The reason he'd gone out into the wilderness to begin with was because he was bothered by the problem of aging, illness, and death. He wondered, was there something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die? And if so, how can you find it? He had tried various ways. None of them had worked. He had tried six years of austerities, and there were five monks looking after him. That didn't work. Finally realized that the austerities were not working, so he began eating again. The five monks got disgusted, left. And so now he was really alone. And so he looked to see what is the big problem in life. Well, what angle can you take on that problem of aging, illness, and death that would actually get you to something that doesn't age, doesn't grow ill, doesn't die? And he finally realized that by focusing on the problem of suffering, what is suffering? What causes suffering? That was the way out. Because you look at the teachings of other teachings at that time, and they talk about other topics. Some of them talk about the world, some of them talk about how there's no really good, anything really good or evil. That good and evil are just social constructs, they're just made up by people. The people who taught that after you die, that's it, there's nothing left, so you might as well enjoy yourself while you can. But no one really looked into the problem of what is this suffering? So that was where the Buddha began to strike out on his own. He found that the suffering was something he you might not have expected. He said it was the five clinging aggregates. And the important part was the clinging. If there's no clinging to the aggregates, then there's no suffering. And why do you cling? Because of craving. So the question is, can you get rid of that craving, the craving for sensuality, the craving for becoming, craving for non-becoming? And the first factor of the path that he found was right concentration. Although there's one other way in which he tells the story, and he actually got started with right resolve, but the two are very closely related. Right resolve is to not focus on sensuality, to focus on renunciation instead. In other words, ways of finding happiness that have nothing to do with sensory pleasures. To resolve on non-ill will, in other words, you have goodwill or equanimity for others, but you don't wish anybody for anybody to suffer. And resolve on non-harm, that you're not going to harm anybody. And 
the way that resolve gets embodied is the mind turns inward to find a sense of well-being inside. And that's what right concentration is all about. And the Buddha is able to follow that path, right concentration, they discover there are other factors as well, everything from right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. He followed that path, developed it, and that was what led to awakening. And in his awakening, he solved two problems at once. One was the problem of suffering in general, and the second was the problem of aging, illness, and death, because he actually found something that didn't age, didn't grow ill, didn't die. And that was what certified the truth of all of his other insights. So here we are out sitting under the trees. Unlike the Buddha, we actually have some guidance. We have a memory of what he taught. And it can help us get focused a lot faster. The big problem is our craving and our clinging. And the way you solve the problem is to work on the path. And as the Buddha pointed out, right concentration is the heart of the path. So let's work on that. The Buddha's instructions for how you get the mind into concentration are under the factor of right mindfulness. You stay focused on, say, the breath in and of itself. Ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. That's the formula. What it means is you focus on the breath simply as it is, as you experience it right here and right now. You're not concerned about whose breath it is or Anything else? Just what is it like to breathe right now? And what kind of breathing would be comfortable? The Buddha does encourage you to breathe in ways that feel good. So you try long breathing, short breathing, faster, slower, heavier, lighter, deeper, more shallow. To see what feels refreshing for the body right now. Because if you're going to engage in renunciation, you can't just give up on pleasures entirely. The Buddha had discovered that already with his six years of austerities. You give up on pleasures of all kinds, you die. But the pleasure of right concentration, you realize, was a pleasure that's blameless. It doesn't take anything away from anyone else. It doesn't encourage the mind to be heedless. And doesn't obscure things. In fact, the more you can find a sense of well-being by being quiet here in the present moment, the clearer things become in the mind. So you try to stay established on the breath, coming in, going out. And then, as the Buddha says, you're ardent, alert, and mindful. Let's take those in backward order. Mindful means you keep in mind the fact that you want to stay here. Sometimes you may want to use a meditation word to help. I think but with the in-breath, to with the out, but to, it's the name of the, it's the title of the Buddha, which means he's awakened. It's interesting, it's a past participle in Pali. You use that to help keep the breath in mind. And then you're alert, in other words, you watch what you're doing. When you're with the breath, you watch the breath. When you're not with the breath, you know that you're not with the breath. And then you bring in ardency. You really want to do this well. And so you find that you're not with the breath, you bring the mind back. It's not like you have to pull the mind back. All you have to do is let go of whatever disturbance or whatever distraction there was. And your awareness will gravitate naturally back to the breath. While you're with the breath, you try to be as sensitive as possible to how the breathing feels. Ask yourself, where do you feel the breathing in the body right now? As you breathe in, where are the sensations that you know that you're breathing in? And they may not be where you expect them, so make a survey all around the body. Watch your hands for a while. When you breathe in, can you tell it in the hands that you're breathing in? When you breathe out, can you tell in your hands that you're breathing out? 
The same with the feet, the arms, the legs, the torso, the head. Can you sense any distinction between the way the body feels as you breathe in, the way it feels as you breathe out? Wherever it's clearest, focus your attention there. But try to keep this full body awareness going at the same time. So you focus simply on the breath right here, right now. Any thoughts of the world, you just let them go. And as your focus gets more solidly established, it turns into right concentration. There will be a sense of ease, a sense of pleasure. What in Pali is called bitti, which we can translate either as rapture or refreshment. These come simply from the fact that your mind is, has withdrawn from unskillful thoughts and is happy to be here. Now you're still talking to yourself about the breath as you try to adjust things and try to catch the mind as its old habits begin to show and starts wandering off again. That talking to yourself is called directed thought and evaluation. That's the way you've been talking to yourself all along. It's just you didn't realize that there were those net terms for it. It's like the woman who discovered after you became an adult that she'd been speaking prose all of her life. She didn't know there was a word for such a thing. But you talk to yourself about the breath in a way that, that gets the mind more and more inclined to want to stay here. And then when it's here, just keep watch over what you've got. If you notice that you're doing anything that's adding unnecessary stress to your concentration, just let it go. Although if you find that if you let certain activities go, you lose your concentration, it means that it's not time to let them go yet. But wherever you discover any unnecessary stress, look for what you're doing that's causing that stress and let that go. When you think in those ways, you're bringing some discernment to your concentration. It's not the case that you have to wait till your concentration is perfected and then you develop discernment. You develop discernment in the process of getting the mind to settle down, because you come to see the mind a lot more clearly and understand what it's doing. So this is how you put the path together. You bring right view, right resolve. The factors having to do with the precepts, you don't have to worry about them right now. You're sitting here, you're not harming anybody. The ones you have to work on are the right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And you find that as you get more and more skilled at these things, that the activity of that effort gets more and more calm. But you still want to be alert. Because there's still the potential for more craving and more clinging in the mind, something that is very quiet right now. But when everything is quiet like this, when these things do begin to show their faces, that's when you can recognize them for what they are. And you see that, yes, the Buddha is right, they really do add more stress onto the mind. So as you protect your concentration, it becomes a way to develop more and more discernment in line with the Four Noble Truths. Now we are getting closer and closer to the, the, the state of the mind that the Buddha had that night of his awakening. You're sitting alone out under the trees, focused on your body as a whole. alert to whatever you're doing that might be causing stress. And then just keep on doing that. Where if you see any stress coming up, you let it go, let it go. That will bring the mind even greater stillness and start seeing even more subtle levels of stress that you didn't see before. 
That's the path you follow. So it's not as if you're, when you're following the path you're going to be here at the beginning of the path and someplace else at the end of the path. You're going to be here all the way. It's just that what you see and what you develop as you develop greater and greater sensitivity, greater and greater concentration, gets more and more refined. Until it reaches a level where something opens up inside. The question came up earlier. How is it that you let go of the three fetters so you can become a stream enterer? It's the other way around. It's through the experience of the deathless that comes as you follow the path. That experience is what cuts through the fetters. When you've seen that this path really does lead to the deathless, that's when your doubts in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are ended. The Buddha really didn't know what he's talking about. The path is the path to the deathless, and the deathless really is deathless, because it's outside of space and time. So there's no way it can change. As for your self-identity views, Sila Bhattabharamasa, you have this experience, but there's no experience of the aggregates in this experience of the deathless. So there's no reason why you would identify, identify yourself with the aggregates. Because you realize that it was an act of discernment that allowed this experience to happen. You stop grasping at precepts and practices. In other words, you don't believe that simply by following a certain practice very obediently it's going to take care of the whole path. It's part of the path. You, know, you follow the precepts, you follow the practice of right concentration. But you realize that they on their own cannot do the work. The work is done by your act of discernment. So as the Buddha said, you, you are virtuous, but you no longer identify yourself around the virtues. When the mind is released from these fetters, things are a lot lighter inside. You've gained an inkling of what the Buddha was talking about. You don't have a full experience of awakening yet, but you know that it's true, and that that's where you're headed. So what we're doing right here under the trees trying to get the mind in the right concentration. is to follow the example of the Buddha. He, of course, didn't have any examples to follow. We're fortunate that we have his story to inspire us and to give us direction. So try to take advantage of that fact while this story is still around.